Hi team, Justin Zeltzer here from zstatistics.com for the final video, the fifth in a series on regression. And this one's to do with the assumptions that underlie our regression. Now, as you can see in the lineup here, we've got six different assumptions we're going to be dealing with in the video. Now, depending on your textbook or your source, you could get listed anywhere between four to nine different regression assumptions. In fact, I think I saw some website that said 10 regression assumptions. Don't be too concerned. Uh, the difference in number generally is because they might split one of these assumptions into uh, sort of component parts, so to speak. Um, so look, with the six I've got here, you're covered for everything you need to be covered by. And in my usual style, I keep it very much intuitive and I don't like using formula where uh, they don't need to be used. So hopefully you'll find all of this extremely intelligible. All right, so let's quickly have a look at this big white balloon here on the right because we're going to be consulting this throughout this video. But this is just any old plain regression and if you've watched any of the videos I've done thus far, you should be somewhat comfortable with the idea of what a regression is. I've kind of stylized it a little bit so I don't have my Y or X axis here because I thought, I don't know, it just looks kind of cool and neat like this. But you can appreciate that your y-axis is here on the left and your x-axis is here down below. And if we're trying to model a relationship like this population regression equation suggests up the top, uh, this suggests a linear equation between y and x. Now what that means graphically is that where you have your scatter plot of all your observations, you're attempting to draw a line of best fit through it. And let's just say our sample regression line looks a bit like this. So the way I would define, so the way we would define this uh, black line here is using the equation, say 3.1 plus 0.74x. So 0.74 is our gradient and 3.1 is the y-intercept, wherever that might lie here. Now again, you'd be familiar with how to interpret output from a regression. I covered that in video three. So let's just say this is our output from this regression line. Now, given that we know how to interpret all of these figures here, our coefficients, our standard errors, our t stat and p values for both the intercept and x, it's important to know that we can only rely on these numbers if certain assumptions hold. So we'll go through them in a sec, but the whole purpose of us dealing with this particular topic is to try to figure out when we can rely on these numbers and when maybe we can't rely on these numbers. Because you don't want to be stuck doing a regression, analyzing it, but it being misleading, and therefore you coming up with the wrong conclusion. So it's really important to understand these assumptions to figure out if your regression is violating them. So one last thing before we move on. Um, when we do violate these assumptions, one of two things tends to happen, and I'll kind of come back to this with each assumption but it's either our coefficients which become unreliable and there we say that they become biased. So the word biased is used there to describe infringements upon the coefficient. Alternatively, it could just be that the standard errors are unreliable. And in that case, any hypothesis testing we're doing on our coefficients is unreliable. So that goes with the T stat and the P value as well. If our standard error is unreliable, so too are those other two metrics. So we'll see when we go through each of these specific assumptions what violating them will do for your regression. So in this video we're going to be taking a sort of medium depth dive into all of these regression assumptions. So to give you a good sense of uh, what they are, how to test for them, and also how to remedy them in your regression models. So it'll be somewhat of an overview for you. I will endeavor to put together deeper dives into all of these assumptions where we can drill down into the testing methods and actually look at examples. But of course, that would just blow out this video to something unmanageable. So we'll keep it medium depth here. And I'll put some links in the description of this video uh, for those that want uh, a little bit more information. So let's have a quick look at them before diving in. Uh, the first assumption here I've got written as linearity, which essentially means that your regression needs to be linear in the betas. That's the phrase that's often used, but it needs to be linear in the parameters. 
It's often misunderstood that this assumption means that you can't have something like an x squared in there or a log x. But of course you can have those types of transformations in your regression equation. You might think of it as then those transformations being linearly related to y, right? So all linearity means is that you have an additive regression equation. So beta naught plus beta 1x and you can also have plus beta 2x2 plus beta 3x3, etc, etc. And that's all that implies, that it's nice and linear and additive. Now the second assumption, there's no necessary order to the rest of the assumptions, but it's constant error variance or homoscedasticity. You might have heard that word before. What that implies is that if you were to map out all of the distances, all these blue dots, the distances between the blue dot and the black line, the variance should be about the same as x increases. So you can see when x is low, the variance is so big. And when x is very high, the variance is also pretty big too. So that seems pretty nice. And you'd suggest that maybe that's constant error variance there, which is quite nice. But we'll see some examples where that does not hold. Uh, the third assumption we'll be looking at is that of independent error terms. So that's when each successive error is independent of the last one. Now, in violating this, that's called autocorrelation. And a very typical plot for an autocorrelative relationship would be a kind of snaking plot. Uh, and we'll see that again when we zoom in to that bubble. Our fourth assumption is that of normal errors or normally distributed errors. So not only do the errors have to be constant in their variance as x increases, but the spread, but those sort of vertical spreads you're seeing here need to be normally distributed. So it's got to have, uh, you know, a bell-shaped probability distribution for each of these vertical snapshots. So most of the data has to be towards the middle and only a few observations on the extremes. The fifth assumption is that of no multicollinearity, or I could have written here truly independent x terms. So multicollinearity occurs when the x variables are themselves related. So you need to have two different x variables for multicollinearity to be an issue. But when the x variables are related to each other, especially when they're very highly related to each other, that causes us big problems. And the final assumption is that of exogeneity. Now that's a somewhat large class of problems, uh, the prevailing symptom of which would be omitted variable bias. So if you've heard of omitted variable bias, that's where we'll be dealing with that particular issue. All right, so are you ready to zoom in to these particular assumptions? Let's go. So the first one was called linearity, but in essence, essentially it's an assumption around correct functional form. So what does that mean? Well, let's have a look at this very simple example. So imagine you're trying to assess someone's lung function, which you can measure. There's something called forced expiratory volume. So if you were to breathe out uh, into some kind of instrument over the course of, you know, five seconds, it can assess how much you're breathing out and that'll assess some kind of lung function. Now, how do you suppose lung function would be affected by age? Well, a relationship like this is probably a little bit idealistic, but for the sake of the exercise, I've made it pretty nice for us to discuss the statistical issues. But imagine this is the relationship where Y is our lung function and X is age. If we were to try to run a linear regression through this particular set of points, in other words, if we were trying to find a gradient for the variable age as it relates to lung function, would essentially be drawing a straight line through this data. And clearly that is an incorrect functional form. So the way we've written this equation is incorrect in terms of the functional form. And I guess one way we could really assess how wrong we've got it is by looking at the residuals. Now we're gonna be using residual plots for the entirety of this video. And all a residual plot is is the original regression equation or the original plot. But imagine this yellow line is kind of 
bent sideways so that it's perfectly horizontal. And then all the dots line up with the vertical distances to that yellow line all on this plot here. So these would be the observed residuals of each of these observations. And you can actually kind of see if you were really paying attention, these individual observations, they're replicated on the residual plot. So there's the really low one here. You can see that's the low observation there. So quite clearly looking at this residual plot, we've got a nice uh, frowny face here, which incidentally should be our own response to this regression equation. We wanted to see a nice even spread across X, but you can see that there's definitely some kind of relationship there. So what we could do is instead of putting together this model here, we could add another variable, age squared. Now, as I said, don't be fooled, this is not violating the linearity assumption. Quite to the contrary, it's still very much a linear model. Why our lung function is linear as it relates to age and age squared. That's the terminology you'd use to describe that. But within including this age squared variable, you've essentially now got a quadratic, right? I mean, you remember this from school, remember? It was y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Well, you've essentially got this just sort of written the other way around and with betas in place of the abc. And if we were to do that, we'd essentially be mapping a quadratic relationship here. I, I don't want to draw it on this plot because technically it's still a linear regression. But what would happen would be that the residuals would now become nice and evenly spread. It just so happened that this relationship here happened to be a, um, a quadratic type relationship. So what's the issue if you violate this assumption? Well, I've written here, if the functional form is incorrect, as we had it originally, both the coefficients and standard errors in your output are unreliable. So remember that table we saw in that big white bubble at the beginning of this video? The coefficients and the standard errors are both unreliable if you're using an incorrect functional form. So that basically means your regression is completely stuffed and you're gonna to have to go back to the drawing board. So getting the correct functional form written as a linear equation is extremely important, without which your regression's pretty useless. So how do you detect issues with incorrect functional form? Well, you can do what we just did and look at a residual plot, and if you see that real kind of frowny face or a smiley face or anything that doesn't look like a nice even spread like this, or anything where the, say, expected value of x is non-zero for particular at particular points along the line, then you know you might have a problem with incorrect specification or incorrect functional form. Another thing you can do is a likelihood ratio test, which I'm not going to go into here, but uh, I will put together a separate video that delves into this a little bit more deeply, where we can look at likelihood ratio tests. But for the purpose of this, let's just appreciate that there are statistical measures will compare the goodness of fit of distinct models. So you could compare the goodness of fit where we were just using age to the model where we're using age and age squared, and you compare those using a likelihood ratio test. And how do you solve it? How do you solve for this problem? Well, you've just got to get the specification correct, and that might take just some trial and error. And if you've got enough observations as we do here, you're not really at any risk of uh, overfitting or what they call p-hacking. All right, so that is linearity. Now let's have a look at the assumption of constant error variance. Now I've stated here that uh, in statistic speak, constant variance is called homoscedasticity. So the assumption of constant variance implies that there's no heteroscedasticity. Whoa. So here's another simple example. Consider you're trying to map out the expenditure, so maybe this is household expenditure, as a function of household income. Now, you know that on average, if, you can, if your income increases, your expenditure will increase. But this doesn't come without some complication. In other words, if you have a very high income, you could either spend a lot or you could spend not very much. 
with a very low income, you don't really have a choice. You can only really spend a small amount. So, what that implies about our distribution is that it might look a bit like this, where if X, which is our income, is very small, you might get a very, a very um, small variance down here where X is small. And when your X increases, so your income increases, you can spend a lot, but you can also spend not very much as well. It's certainly possible to be very miserly with your big bad paychecks, but at least your income gives you that choice, right? Now, you can run a regression, find an estimate for beta naught and beta 1, and let's just say this yellow line is it. And when we look at our residual plot, you really do get a sense that the variance or the spread of these points is increasing as X is increasing. Now, that's a problem. And that problem is called heteroscedasticity. Hetero meaning numerous, scedasticity meaning probably variance, I would say. Um, but yeah, you can see it's non-constant, that sort of vertical variance. Consider these sort of vertical cross-sections at each point of X and assess the, the sort of spread at each of those points. It's definitely less spread on the left side than there is on the right side. So, what's the big deal? What happens if you run a regression with heteroscedasticity present? Well, the standard errors in your output can't be relied upon. So, our coefficients, the actual gradient of this line is still unbiased and you can rely upon that. But the variance or our hypothesis tests we might want to conduct on that gradient, like for example, if we want to try to assess whether that gradient is positive, we won't be able to do it because our standard errors are problematic. So, how do we detect it? Well, there are numerous methods. Uh, the Goldfield Quant test is one that's used quite often and the Broich Pagan test is another one that's used. I go into both of those in detail in the heteroscedasticity specific video that I've put together. But again, for the purpose of this overview, you can go and research those yourself if you like. Um, but appreciate all you need to do to conduct these tests if you're familiar with your statistical software is just ask that software to conduct them. And you can find a p-value for each of these tests which will tell you whether heteroscedasticity is a problem or not. The remedies? Well, you'll often see this, but um, in our regression output, we can actually ask our statistical software to provide what's called heteroscedastic corrected errors. They're also called robust standard errors or white's standard errors. And what that does is it kind of accounts for the heteroscedasticity and gives us standard errors that incorporate that. Usually what that means is that our standard errors increase quite a little bit. So we become less confident about those coefficients. Another option is by changing the equation a little bit and weighting each of the variables. Again, I don't want to go into that too deeply, but you can have a look. But that would be one of the remedies you could use. And finally, um, you could just log things. As it turns out, logging variables, y and x, tends to solve a lot of problems. And one of those problems it solves is heteroscedasticity. So, if you're ever at a loose end and you're wondering, I really want to keep these variables together, but it's providing me with this heteroscedastic residual plot, just have a go and see what happens when you log both variables and reassess the residual plot once you run the new regression. It's magical how that works sometimes. In general though, even though I've just said log things, you can try transforming the variables um, using other transformations as well. And that is constant variance. Let's have a look at independent error terms. Now you might have heard the term autocorrelation or serial correlation. That's S-E-R-I-A-L correlation. And that would represent a violation of the independence of error terms. Now, something to note about autocorrelation is that it's a violation that can only occur to time series data. So, there needs to be some kind of order of your X variable. In other words, if you have cross-sectional data, like a survey or um, pretty much every other example we're using in this video, 
you don't need to worry about autocorrelation because there's no natural order to your x variable. However, in this example, let's just say we're trying to map out a long-term trend of some kind of stock index. We can run a regression where the x variable is actually a time variable. So each successive value of x relates to the one before it. It's the next time period, right? So this is where autocorrelation could be a problem. So if we go to our scatter plot, it might not be uncommon to see a plot here where x is the time variable and y is our stock index. You might see a kind of snaking pattern like this, where if we were to run a line of best fit, again, it could go straight through it. Our residual plot would certainly show some kind of clustering of these residuals. Now, quite clearly, clearly as I've simulated these plots here, I've made it very nice for us to visualize, but your residual plots might not be this obvious. Nonetheless, if you spy some kind of relationship like this, you're, you might be subject to autocorrelation. Essentially, what that means is that each of the residuals is affected by the one before it. So, you can have a look at all these residuals here and if you knew the residual that preceded it, you'd have a good guess at where the next residual is going to be, right? If I told you that we just had a very positive residual, you'd probably guess that the next residual for the next time period was also going to be very positive. And that's a problem. What's the issue here? Well, under autocorrelation, standard errors in the output cannot be relied upon. So much like with heteroscedasticity, the same thing goes. Our estimated coefficients are still unbiased. In other words, they're still the best estimate for that relationship, but the standard errors can't be relied upon. So any kind of inference we'd like to conduct or hypothesis testing on those coefficients becomes a bit um, controversial. So how do you detect autocorrelation? There's a couple of tests. The Durbin-Watson test uh, detects specifically autocorrelation of the first order. What that means is that where the preceding observation affects the current observation. The Broich-Godfrey test uh, does it more generally. And so it looks back at, say, the T minus 1, T minus 2, T minus 3, etc., etc. And it can test whether there's any autoregression beyond that first order. And again, you could, you could call these two tests using a statistical software. They certainly exist in R. I'm sure they exist in Stata and all that as well. Um, and then you could just use those p-values you get from those tests to assess whether that's a problem for you. Now, the remedies here, are, I've written here that you can investigate omitted variables. Now, we're going to deal with omitted variable bias a bit later, but this is a bit of a different scenario because quite clearly here, we might say that not only is the long-term trend affecting our stock index, but maybe the business cycle, you know, those booms and busts that affect the entire economy, um, maybe that is affecting our stock index as well. And incorporating that business cycle or some kind of index for that business cycle in this model as an X variable, will actually start being able to model that relationship there. So, so in doing so, you might find that your residual plot for Y versus X being a long-term trend, it might even out once you actually incorporate the cause of that autocorrelation. Another option is creating what's called a generalized difference equation. So I'll go into detail. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail for the autocorrelation video that I put together. But to give you a quick overview as to what happens there, um, if you subtract from your stock index some kind of weighted value of the previous stock index, you're essentially creating a difference here as your Y variable. And in creating that difference, you're now modeling that difference in your regression. And as you'll find out if you investigate this further, the error term no longer is autocorrelated once you've done that. And there are two different ways, two different methods for creating those generalized differences. The Cochrane-Orkut 
method or the AR autoregressive one method. But those would be the things you would look out for to remedy your autocorrelation. Let's keep going. Let's have a look at normal errors. So the normality of the error terms, um, for this particular example, I've created a model here where we're modeling the medical insurance payout uh, as a function of, say, the insurance customer's age. Now, in this very simplified example, you might find that there's a whole lot of zeros. So most people that take out insurance won't claim a big medical insurance item which is actually the whole purpose of insurance, right? And then you've got some people that are paid out a huge sum, well, a very large sum for uh, all manner of injury or, or whatever form of poor luck they've uh, stumbled across. Now, again, you could draw a line of best fit and it might look a bit like that. That's fine. And if we have a look at our residuals, firstly, you might get the sense that there's probably a bit of heteroscedasticity uh, going on here as well. But even aside from that, we've got another issue which is to do with the normality of error terms. Now, what that means is you should be able to take these sort of vertical cross sections across each value of x and it should be a nice bell-shaped distribution. What I mean by a bell-shaped distribution is that a, most of the data should be centered around the line, around zero, residuals of zero, and it should get more sparse as you go further out from that line of best fit. Now, this doesn't really accord with that, does it? You can see we've got a whole clump just a little bit below X, and then these kind of ones out here on the positive side. So what's the issue if your normality is violated? Now, this, this is a, has a few different responses if you were to look online, uh, but generally this is seen as one of those, as a bit of a weak assumption for regression. So if you're violating normality, it's not usually considered a big problem, particularly if you have a large number of observations. Now, essentially what that means is that with a large number of observations, the central limit theorem will apply. And it basically means that that true relationship will kind of come out when you have enough observations. So even though this looks a bit clunky here, because we have so many observations, it's uh, potentially giving us the correct gradient with uh, an appropriately measured variance around that slope coefficient. But if you have a small number of observations and you're noticing some kind of problem with your residual output, uh, then the standard errors in your output are affected. Now, you'd be quite right in pointing out that you can only really assess whether your normality is violated if you have enough observations to start with, right? If I only had, say, you know, 10 or 12 observations, it's kind of difficult to assess whether normality is being violated. So it's almost like a self-limiting problem in that if you can observe normality being violated, it becomes less of an issue because you've got such a large sample size. Anyway, notwithstanding that, there's, there's a whole host of ways of detecting abnormality. Uh, the simplest being you could just look at a histogram of these residuals as opposed to a scatter plot, which is not so helpful. If I plot these residuals on a histogram, you've got all these kind of negative residuals, right? But uh, quite small negative residuals. And then you have just a few really high observations. So it's hard to see here, but we've got a couple of really high um, observations. And clearly this is not a nice bell-shaped curve, right? You'd want this to be a nice bell shape, but it certainly is not that in my example. Another way of assessing normality is by using what's called a QQ plot. Now, this QQ plot has not been created from my data. I just nicked this from the internet. Uh, but all it is, is it maps out the quantiles from your data set with the theoretical quantiles you get from a normal distribution. So in our example, we might have had, what, 300 observations or something like that. If you had 300 observations, in a normal distribution, the lowest one might be way down here in terms of its uh, z-score. And you'd map that against what we actually got for the lowest observation in our sample. And you would do that for each successive observation all the way along. And if these observations lie on a nice straight diagonal line, you know that the residuals are normally distributed. But if it deviates, as this one kind of does a little bit, 
um, you might think that it deviates from normality, particularly at the extremes here for this particular example. Ours would obviously deviate significantly given the peculiarity of the data set that I created. So what are the remedies? Uh, again, you could try changing the functional form and log things again. But as I said, it's not really such a big deal and you can just try to get more observations in your data set if that's possible. All right, so let's have a look at the fifth assumption here and that's of no multicollinearity. So let's consider a new model. Let's say motor accidents are being presented as a function of the number of cars in a particular suburb. And also we're gonna put the number of residents in the suburb too, because you, you can appreciate that um, not only does the number of residents in a suburb affect the number of accidents, but um, if most of those residents are taking public transport, you might have fewer motor, motor accidents, right? So this is a multiple linear regression with two variables, two X variables. Now, multicollinearity occurs when the X variables are themselves related. And here you can see that that's definitely going to be the case, right? As the number of residents increases in a particular suburb, so too with the number of cars generally, right? You're not going to have tens of thousands of cars in a suburb with a very small number of residents, are you? So these two variables are going to be pretty well related to each other. Now that's a problem for this regression because ideally what this regression is trying to do is isolate, is isolate the individual effects of these two X variables on Y, on our motor accidents. So the way we would interpret uh, an output value of beta 1 would be to say, well, that's, that would be the expected effect on the number of motor accidents if the number of cars in the suburb increased by 1. But don't forget when we interpret things like that, we always say holding other variables constant. Remember that line we always say when we interpret coefficients? Well, we can't really do that here because you can't hold number of residents constant while you keep increasing the number of cars. Logically, it doesn't really make sense that way. So to interpret our coefficient of the number of cars, holding all other variables constant becomes impossible. Another way of thinking about it is that our X variables will vary so closely together that the equation that our model here will have trouble identifying which of these two made the difference for the motor accidents, right? It'll only be able to separate, oh, was it the number of cars or was it the number of residents? It'll only be able to separate those two effects if indeed we have X variables where these values diverge. Anyway, so that's the sort of theory, the intuitive reason why multicollinearity is an issue. But in terms of the effect on your output, again, your standard errors are going to be unreliable, but also your coefficients are somewhat unreliable too. And in particular, when you have a very high degree of multicollinearity, your model actually starts shutting down. Um, there's something called perfect multicollinearity, uh, where if you were to include two variables, two X variables that were perfectly collinear, so that one is exactly proportional to the other, then your model actually won't be able to run at all. To detect multicollinearity, you can look at the correlation between number of cars and number of residents. You can literally just take those two variables and find the correlation between those two values. And if it's particularly high, quite close to one, um, then you might have an issue. Another thing is where we use what's called the variance inflation factor. Without going into too much depth, essentially what that does is it looks at each of the variables, each of our candidate multicollinear variables and assesses what's the difference when I've taken it out versus put it in to the regression. How does the variance of the regression affected once we include it in? And if the variance is massively affected, you know that there's going to be some considerable multicollinearity between that variable and all those that are already included in the model. So putting that another way, the higher the variance inflation factor for a variable, the more that that variable's information is already contained in the model. 
hidden in other variables. So the remedies for multicollinearity would be just to remove one of the variables. Uh, whichever one you think is the most relevant, you can remove the other one. So say you wanted to include number of cars but didn't want to include uh, the number of residents, that would be okay. Uh, for our example, I might just go back. For our example, let's just kind of go back for a sec. So say you wanted to include number of residents uh, but take out number of cars. So hopefully then your number of residents gives you some kind of proxy for how big that suburb is. Um, but say you still wanted to get some kind of information in this model as to whether these residents live in apartment blocks or whether they live in you know, homes with a garage and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you could include a variable. You could be crafty and include another variable that's not collinear with the number of residents. So say you might have proportion of apartment dwellings, right? That would solve your problem because the proportion of apartment dwellings might not be as collinear with the number of residents in a particular suburb, but it might give you some indication as to the likely density of motor vehicles in the suburb. Anyway, I have tangentialized a little. To remedy multicollinearity, you remove one of the variables. And I've just added a, uh, a note here. Um, and it's uh, a note I'm adding because it's this issue is tends to be confused often with the idea of interaction terms in a model. Some people might think, oh, I know how to fix this problem. I'm going to include an interaction term where I multiply number of cars by the number of residents. I'm going to jam that in the model as well. And that's going to solve my issue of multicollinearity. Ba -bow, that's wrong. There's actually, it's a subtle but very important difference when the x variables are related, in this case, multicollinearity, versus when the x variables are exhibiting some kind of interaction with y. Now, I won't go into it in too much depth here because I don't want to get too derailed, but an interaction between these two x variables would mean that x2 is impacting the effect that x1 has on y. And that's a subtly different issue than if x2 and x1 are both related. Anyway, that's it. There's multicollinearity. All right, well, let's look now at the sixth regression assumption, which is exogeneity, or no omitted variable bias. So again, I'm going to present you with a model so we can give some kind of like meat on the bones of this theoretical example. Let's try, let's say you're trying to map out someone's salary as a function of the number of years they've had of education. The idea being that the more years of education you have, the higher your salary is likely to be, right? You'd think, you'd hope. Now, if you were to run this regression, you'd probably find the estimate for beta 1 to be positive. You'd expect that, right? But there's an issue with years of education as it relates to salary. Because if you think about it, there's a whole lot of other things that are associated with the years of education that one has that might also affect your salary. So, for example, just your socioeconomic status of your parents or just of your household, um, that might be determinative of the number of years of education you receive, particularly if uh, university fees are as high as they are. You're going to need to have some level of socioeconomic status to achieve those years of education to start with. And it might be that socioeconomic status that avails to you that salary as well. So what I'm implying here is that there's a variable that's actually pulling the strings of this relationship. So it's not as if the education is necessarily providing this level of marginal benefit to your salary, but it might just be an indication of how socioeconomically advantaged you already were. And it's that socioeconomic advantage that's giving you a higher salary, right? So I've said here, socioeconomic status affects both X and Y variables. Thus, I've said would here, but technically I should probably say could, thus could cause omitted variable bias. So that's generally the test. If you have a variable that's omitted from the model, but nonetheless affects both X and Y, it could cause omitted variable bias. Now, 
The reason why it's called exogeneity, or in the case of omitted variable bias, you'd say that exhibits endogeneity, is because, so soci- is because socioeconomic status here, you can say, is technically affecting the error term. Because it's omitted, its only way of affecting salary is through this error term that we consider, hopefully, to be random and normal and not, and not exhibit any heteroscedasticity and all that kind of stuff. But that is where our socioeconomic status is going to be feeding in to this equation. And in other words, this X variable is actually no longer wholly exogenous. It's no longer wholly determined from outside the model. Part of it is going to be determined by the error term. It's going to be related to that error term. In other words, endogenous to the model because of this omitted variable which is incorporated in that error term. So that's why it's called exogeneity, where we presume that each X variable gives us information that's completely external to the rest of the model. It can't be determined from other parts of the model, particularly the error term, right? So look, if if you're not perfectly savvy with that explanation, that's okay. As long as you can see the issue with this first statement that if socioeconomic status is uh, omitted, you're essentially leaving out something that's pulling the strings of this relationship between years of education and salary, potentially, right? So what's the issue if you just leave that variable out and just proceed as planned? Well, your model can still be used for predictive purposes. And this raises an interesting point. Regression models generally can be used for two purposes. The first of which is just to use it for predictive purposes. So for example, you get your coefficients and then you can get, um, say you want to predict it for you know, someone else who has 13 years of education. You can plug in the values and get an expected salary. That still holds when there's omitted variable bias. So if I know I had 13, 14 years of education or whatever it is, it doesn't matter that social economic status is omitted. I can still get a valid prediction for my salary based on my years of education. But what we can't do is infer causation between those years of education that I received and the salary. So the actual coefficient beta 1 no longer has a valid causative interpretation. So I can't say that it's because I had 13 years of education or that 13th year of education that my salary was so high or whatever. So how do you detect omitted variable bias? Uh, Well, unfortunately, you're left to use your own intuition here. Um, No diagnostics are really going to be able to tell you, in this instance, that socioeconomic status would have been useful, right? A model can only deal with what variables you give it. It won't be able to tell you anything about variables you leave out. But in using your intuition, you might want to check how much socioeconomic status is correlated with years of education and how much it's correlated with salary and see if indeed those correlations are quite high. Now, there are metrics to uh, establish a quantitative value for someone's socioeconomic status. Sometimes they're just categorical values, one, two, three, four, five, depending on what sort of suburb you live in maybe. But there are ways of quantifying someone's socioeconomic status. So that could be done. Now, the remedy is a really interesting one. Um, It's a bit advanced, and I will do this in the video I put together for omitted variable bias in detail. But what you can do is use what's called instrumental variables. So if you want to tease out the effect of an additional year of education, as we've just found, we can't just use a cross-sectional data set like this. Ultimately, it'd be great if you could do a randomized control trial where you randomize a certain number of people to receive, you know, a high school level of education and randomize another set of people to receive university education, etc., etc., right? That, that's clearly not ethical or possible in this instance. But instrumental variables take advantage of these sort of natural randomizing forces that might exist in other variables.
Oof, what does that mean? Well, there's actually an interesting study that happened in, I think, the 70s, 1973 or something. And it was trying to work out this exact relationship to try to see whether years of education or what the marginal effect of an additional year's education was on someone's salary. And at the time, there was conscription happening for the Vietnam War. And one way that um, some of the people that didn't want to go to war could get out of it would be to enroll in university to have some kind of uh, deferral placed on their army service. So you had this fairly unique randomization where if you're if you were part of the draft, you were much higher. You actually had a higher chance of going to university than if you were not part of the draft. So instead of using education or years of education, you could use the draft variable as an instrument to approximate someone's education. And that instrument suffers none of this omitted variable bias. Anyway, that's a that's a very that's a massive oversimplification of that uh, particular paper, but uh, that's something you could do. And there you have it. We've reached the end of not only this video but of the entire series. I was always planning on doing on regression. If you have a look at the timestamp on the very first regression video, regression part one, you'll notice it's taken me some time to put these all together. Um, but if you've seen them all, thanks very much. And I've got a whole bunch of other videos up on zstatistics.com. As I said, I'm going to be doing more detailed analyses of each of these assumptions in their own separate videos to allow a bit more time to focus on those tests and those remedies. But for now, it's goodbye. And if you've enjoyed the videos, please subscribe to the channel. And also you might want to investigate a, a podcast I've just started. It's called Jeremy's Iron, which will allow us to use a lot of this statistical knowledge and apply it to the real world. I'll put the link to that in the description, but it's called Jeremy's Iron. And hey, if you're feeling charitable, you can subscribe to us on iTunes as well. But I'll see you later.